But as you can see, our teams um, are setting up for the event this afternoon. And I'm so humbled and grateful that we are really at standing room only this morning. And you didn't turn around and get frustrated and say, I'm going home because I don't have a parking spot. You persevered and came here anyway. Let's give God a hand for that. One of the most precious things we have in life is time. And when you give your time um, to someone, and some of us have too much time. Um, I, again, like I said, I don't even know really where I am right now. I don't know if we're in the evening service, morning service. I mean, if it's Sunday or whatever else, I just show up and suit up. <laughs> and I've learned in life to really simplify life and do the next right thing for the right reason. And I'm grateful for a lot of right results. But I really got blessed um, um, as I was running to another business meeting and um, preparing. I mean, and I'm so grateful for Kylie Benson. Let's give him a hand. So we're getting to the point now where I just got to show up. I mean, and I even got a sport coat on today. What do you think about this? I, I've never preached in dress shoes before. I've never preached in dress shoes before, but time is something that is precious. So on Friday, um, as we did the volunteer meeting and I, got, I started crying because as a pastor, I'm extremely fortunate and lucky to have a congregation like you. Amen. I'm very grateful for you. I'm very grateful for the level of servants that we have in this church. But I ran home and I was running down to the university and I was running back out of my house and, 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 and there were a, a couple people that were walking up my driveway that are from Dallas, Texas. Now this is as close as close gets. Um, Holloway and Denise Gray. Um, Holloway served with Bishop Jakes and still does, and he's a, in just the most humble, high-level man, and his wife Denise is everything behind him and everything she is, but they came all the way up from Dallas, Texas to celebrate. I want you to stand, and I want you to honor these two people. They are incredible people. They are close friends of mine. I love you with all my heart. I honor you. I'm grateful for you. I value you, and I respect you. And most of all, I love you. You're a blessing. And it was such a blessing um, as, as we've been. I'm ex extremely excited. I'm, I'm a week out in front. I've never been a week out in front of these messages before. And we're about, you know, twice, three times, ten times busier than we've ever been. And that's the grace of God. Uh, I mean, a lot of people can't find the time. you got to make the time. And at the end of the day, I'm a week out. I've already got next Sunday's message um, prepared, and I was extremely excited um, studying for that because um, a lot of us just look at God as a resource. Now, God is a resource. He's the ultimate source, but we forget about the relationship. And next Sunday, I'm going to teach you the difference between the relationship and the resource, and you really can't take advantage of the resources without the relationship. And sometimes God will give you a resource before you have a relationship just to teach you that the relationship is important. But if you falter in the relationship, the resources may be cut off. The love will never be cut off. The love is always there. But as I was preparing a couple weeks ago for this morning's message, um, I was just amazed. And, and I'll never forget a, a message that Bishop Jakes had taught about uh, Jesus likes to party. But this morning, I'm here to tell you that Jesus likes to party too. This morning, I'm here to tell you that Jesus attended parties, and Jesus changed the game of the party, and Jesus even turned water into wine. Now, I don't want to say that out loud here because a lot of us are in recovery, so don't get too excited. So at the end of the day, Jesus likes to party too, and I think that's really the problem with church today is, as I said earlier, churches are too traditional. Churches are too routine. Churches, um, people are afraid to go to church. And people um, want to get their lives together before they walk into church, and they don't realize that it's church that's going to get your life together. But it's not just, it's not church, it's Jesus. And too many people don't even know who Jesus is. How can you, I mean, no, I, I can't say how can you, because I see it all the time, and possibly I used to do it. How can you be mad at somebody you don't know? I mean, how can you be mad at Jesus when you don't know him? You just, you're going with your interpretation of somebody that disappointed you that claimed to know him. But let them off the hook because we disappoint people too. We're not him. We're not God. We're people. People have pressure. People have problems. I'm a pastor with problems. 
And I'm okay to say that. And I'm in need of a savior. And I'm not afraid to tell you who he is. And I'm not afraid to tell you what he's done for me. And I'm not afraid to tell you everything that he's restored in my life. So Lord, I ask through the power of your living active word, the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, I am tapped out, run down, but I'm excited because I got your spirit running through my veins. I learned from Bishop years ago, if tired doesn't, um, is left unchallenged, it will always rain. Lord, don't, I don't want to pay attention to my physical being right now. I ask that you elevate me through the power of your Holy Ghost. Lord, have your way. Speak through my vocal cords. Think through my mind. None of me and all of you have your way here this morning as we prepare for an event that again will shake the ground to crystal. In your name we pray, amen. Let's give God a hand. I want to talk to you briefly this morning, um, as I said earlier, about that Jesus goes to parties too. Now, I've been to a lot of parties that I didn't see Jesus at. I've hosted a lot of parties um, that I didn't see Jesus at, but as I reflect on that statement, I think he was there because he kept me alive in the party. He got me out of the party and woke me up the next morning after the party. See, those next mornings after the party are rough. So maybe Jesus was really at the party, we were just ignoring him. And right now, um, throughout the world, Jesus is attending parties, both good and bad parties, um, because he loves people and he wants people to have the peace that transcends all understanding. But Jesus attended a party in Nazareth. Um, Jesus attended this party in Nazareth, and it's very important for you to recognize and really um, look at the similarities of the party we're going to host this afternoon for the community. And, 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 and then I want to uh, take it to a practical standpoint uh, um, on, on on, on what Jesus may be wanting to do and is doing and will do in your life. So Jesus attends this party in Nazareth, and it says, now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. This afternoon, we're going to welcome Jesus to the party. Quite frankly, we're not going to wait till this afternoon. We're going to welcome Jesus right now. Let's welcome Jesus to the party. Jesus is welcome at this party. So the crowd welcomed him, and they were expecting him. Like Jacqueline said earlier, we got to have a spirit of expectation. You get what you expect. I expect this morning to be great. I expected yesterday to be great. I expect this afternoon to be great. I expect tomorrow to be great. I expect my business to grow. I expect territory to expand. I expect my children to be healthy. I, I want to sow out a spirit of expectation out there. At the end of the day, you got to be intentional. You can't sit back and wait for it to happen you're gonna miss your whole purpose you got to get out there and make it happen you can't be sitting back on what you did yesterday you got to make what happens what you want to be done tomorrow at the end of the day I teach my leaders this all the time don't do what you can do today tomorrow because if you don't do what you can do today tomorrow God can't bring you tomorrow what he had for you tomorrow because you didn't do it today see you got to understand that time is the only thing you got it don't make no sense as we can host a church service this morning. We got hundreds of volunteers in the parking lot. Um, um, we, we did what we did yesterday. I mean, on a daily basis. And then we run the businesses and all the different things that God has us doing. So, so they, they were expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, and it's important for you to understand this now. Um, we know the story of, of the blind man, and, 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 and he says, and he's getting persecuted by the church. And, you know, I mean, they're like, well, who healed you and who did this? And, you know, they weren't celebrating that the brother was once blind and now he can see. They, were, they didn't like the way that Jesus healed him and performed the miracle. And, and they were persecuting this blind man. I don't know if, if, if you know the feeling of, I mean, I just want people to be happy for me and with me. I don't need to hear your opinion. I'm happy. Just be happy with me and for me. Don't tell me how you feel about my happiness. Just be happy for me. I don't know if you're happy, but I'm happy. Don't try to, I'll tell you how I'm happy and full of joy, but don't try to screw scrutinized my joy. Right. They were scrutinizing his brother. He was blind from birth. He couldn't see. And, they, and Jesus healed him. And, and the church started to scrutinize and, and, and really persecute him. He says, one thing I know, I was blind and, and, and now I see. I don't know what your one thing is this morning. But one thing I do know this morning at 50 years of age, that I was a drug addicted crackhead. And now I can see. And I don't want to ever forget about my one thing. But beyond my one thing, God picked me around. He turned me upside down and put me on solid ground. God wants to do more than one thing in your life. 
This your day because I went to Dallas. That's why I got the sport coat. I was there on Monday for 30 hours. I had to buy a sport coat because last time he saw me, he goes, oh, you dressed down, huh? I said, I don't know if that's good that you just said that to me. Next time I came, I showed up in a sport coat. <laughs> see, see, it, if you're only doing one thing, you're not doing much of anything. At the end of the day, here's Jairus, and when we go back to the blind man, the blind man's parents, they even started persecuting the parents, like, well, is it true that your son was blind? Um, can you really verify that he was blind? Because we got to make sure this miracle is true. And all these haters, and, and the parents were tripping because they were in the synagogue, and, and if they would have confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, they would have been kicked out of the synagogue. Check out this party. Jairus is a synagogue leader. See, at the end of the day, Jairus, he shouldn't be going to Jesus. It was against religion to go to Jesus. Because Jesus isn't about religion. Jesus is about relationship. But Jairus was at his last resort. See, when, when, you, when you try everything and it just don't work, and you try the self-help, and you try to step and jump down and do the splits, and yay, I'm going to have a great day, and you still have a bad day, maybe it's time to try Jesus. And this is where Jairus is, and he's going against the grain of the synagogue, against the family. He wasn't even doing it secretively. He was going, oh, my 12-year-old daughter, read the screen, is dying, and Jesus is my last resort. And he was willing to put it all on the line, what the family would say, what the church would say, what the, pe the haters would say. The people would say, what do you mean? You said you didn't believe in Jesus, and now you're going to Jesus to get healed. He fell on his feet. When you're in a spirit of desperation, you'll do anything. And I'm here to tell you, I wish Jesus wasn't our last resort. If Jesus was your first resort, your life would look a lot different. See, see, I'm not here to tell you as the pastor of the church that Jesus is always my first resort, but when he isn't, it doesn't turn out well. Wow. So here's Jairus, and Jesus said, all right, he's at the party. And, 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 and I love a statement um, that, that one of my associates at work gave me, and it's in, in my corporate office. It says, let me drop everything and work on your problem. You know we got those people in our lives. <laughs> let me drop everything and work on your problem. So Jesus drops everything, so he goes with Jairus. And he goes with Jairus, and, and he's walking um, with him, and there's this woman. Say woman. woman. See, this afternoon, there's going to be some people. Yeah. See, there's going to be some daughters dying that are going to be here. There's going to be some fathers that have daughters dying, and they're not going to know what to do. And it's important that they see the love of Jesus in us. Sure. And, 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 and they're going to want to take Jesus back to their home after they leave this property. And that's what Jairus said. But while Jesus was walking with Jairus, um, um, this woman that, that had an issue, um, this afternoon, and, 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 and full of this sanctuary and Mia time, we got issues. And we think our issues are other people. Let me tell you, ish you. <laughs> Say ish me. It ain't your dad, it ain't your mom, it ain't your girl, it ain't your boy, it ain't your kids, it ain't your job, ish you. If you just figure out that your issues are you and not everybody else, Jesus can work with you. So he's on the way and this woman with the issue of blood um, and has been bleeding for 12 years. This is the problem with church today. She's been bleeding with 12, for 12 years in religion back then and I think in religion today, people are afraid when they're unclean and living in sin to talk about it and go to church. No different than this woman that's been suffering with the issue of blood for 12 years. She's afraid to touch Jesus. Religion has told her she can't touch Jesus. She was so down and out, no different than Jairus, she was willing to break religion to get her healing. Church, we got to figure out how to break religion and get a healing. We got to figure out how to get people to touch Jesus. So she goes, and she, this afternoon you're going to see it. People are going to go through the crowd. People are going to crunch up against you. And this woman touched Jesus, and immediately, say immediately. Immediately, immediately she was healed. See, this afternoon you're going to see at this party some people that are going to immediately be healed. And now it goes on to say, Jesus says, who touched me? Because Jesus knew that, that, that the power had left him. Now, now this blows my mind as well. See, because 
back in those days, and I think there's still those days are still these days, um, unclean people are not supposed to touch clean people. Church people like, oh, pastor, you, you're such a sinner. Stay away. I'll pray for you from a distance. No, 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 I'm going to pray for you right now because sometimes I'm dirty too. Sometimes I sin too. Sometimes I have a bad attitude too. Sometimes I wake up on the wrong side of the bed too. So who am I to judge you? He's the only one that can judge me. I'm not the judge. He's the judge. We got to spread the love. We got to spread the grace. And I, I love it. So, so this woman that is unclean, and she's afraid because she touched Jesus. She ain't supposed to touch nothing clean. See, they got it all backwards. It's the unclean that need to touch the clean in order to get clean. We can't keep the unclean out of church because church is full of unclean people. There's more unclean people in church than are out of church. Let's bring the unclean in and out of church to the clean, which is the blood of Jesus. Let's give God a hand. And at the end of this scripture, um, basically, um, Jesus, she says, who touched? She now owns up and she's testifying. And what she says is powerful to me um, and because now it's being said that she, he says, my daughter. See, her identity, this is powerful to me. Wow. This is powerful. She, see, a lot of us are known by our issues. Right. See, see, the identity, you know, the miracle, I don't think was just that her bleeding stopped. See, some of us are emotionally bleeding, psychologically bleeding, mentally bleeding, physically hurting. And Jesus can stop all that immediately. But I don't think that was the real miracle of this story and parable, this text. The real miracle to me is this. The bleeding stopped. She was known as the woman, still, we don't even know her name, the woman with the issue of blood. See, some of you are out of something that you used to be in, into, you're, but you're still feeling like you're in it. Yeah. See, see, God took them out of Egypt and Egypt was still in them. Yeah. Something happened to you 10 years ago that's still in you. You're out of it. Yeah, out the of real it. miracle is this. Check this out. This is profound to me. <laughs> I'm glad God just brought this to me. God is amazing. Great all your look. How great thou art. Great all your Lord. I'm 50 and still breathing. Yeah. <laughs> Check this out. Check out, check, out, check out this miracle. Check out this miracle. The miracle was awesome when her bleeding stopped. But if her bleeding would have stopped and she would have left there still known as the woman. See, you know, that's, the, that's the woman that was married to you know who. Not married to you know who anymore, but still known as you know who we're married to. See, see, that's that pastor that was a crackhead. He ain't no crackhead no more, but he's still known as a crackhead. See, this is the real miracle. I'm going to tell you here in a second. The miracle is not that the bleeding stopped, even though it was a miracle. The miracle was when she left, she was no longer known as a woman with the issue of blood. Jesus said, daughter, her identity shifted. When your identity shifts, you're no longer known by your issues. She's a daughter now of the king of kings. Let's give God a hand. I want to tell you about another party that Jesus went to. It, it was the party of Cana of Galilee. This is a cool party. Jesus comes walking up on the party, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the party. Jesus' mother was there. So Jesus is chilling. So, you know, sometimes you got to chill. And, and I don't know if Jesus just wanted to chill at the party, but, but, but at this party, it was a big, big ceremony. And at the party, they ran out of wine. So Jesus' mother, and sometimes, you know, your mom's going to ask you to do something. So Jesus' mother says, hey, we're out of wine. And Jesus says, what does that have to do with me? <laughs> so what does this afternoon have to do with you to welcome thousands of people that you don't know into a parking lot and feed them and paint their kids' faces and put their kids in bouncy houses and feed them the best ribs in town and get the chefs from all the city to give them all the things we're going to do? Fly in musicians. What does that have to do with you? It has everything to do with you because people need to know we care. Yeah. People need to know that the church can party too. So he rolls up on this party and his mom says to him, hey, you know, we're out of wine. He goes, my time has not come yet. 
Jesus ain't ready yet. He, he, knows, he knows when his time's coming, but, but you know, there's certain questions. Um, see, see, you got to have a level of expectation with Jesus. You know, Jesus, I know you're chilling. I know you're here with your disciples, but hey, hey, we're out of wine. And his mother knew it, but most likely everybody else didn't yet. His mother knew who he was. And the other people were here, so they were out of wine. And, 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 and I love what his mom said. His mom says, do whatever he says to do to the servants. See, what would your life look if you did everything the Bible says to do? What would your life look like if you did everything that you hear today, what the word says to do? His mother says, do whatever he says to do. And now he, he, she walks away and just leaves Jesus hanging because she knew he was going to do it. See, sometimes you ask Jesus to do something and you sit there all day keeping and ask him. All you have to do is ask him once and then go back to what you were doing. He heard you. He'll give it to you in time. Just you ask him. He heard you. And, and I love what it says here because this is profound to me. So now the servants um, are sitting there. And you know what? God don't always do it for you, but most likely God's going to do it with you. You got to do your part. So he says to the servants, this is profound to me too. I love the word of God. So they're in this wedding ceremony, um, part of the Jewish culture. You know, we're, they're dealing with religion. And I think this is the challenge with churches today. Um, we're too traditional, no different than the man that sat by the pool and waited for the water to stir. He was waiting on a tradition and transformation walked up on him. So you got to understand, don't be mad at Jesus. He is the coolest dude I've ever met. He's so chill. He's even got long hair. It's awesome. But at the end of the day, here, here, here these servants are, and they're out of wine, and, and here's what Jesus tells them to do. He says, um, there, there's these six bowls, and these bowls are used for religious purposes. They're used for purification. Um, they're a religious ceremony type thing at this wedding, and, and that's the challenge with churches today. Churches are only used for religion. Come on. We have our, I mean, here, 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 Jesus turns the whole tables. And you can imagine, now hold up, you can't use those bowls. Those are used for purification. <laughs> and you're certainly not going to turn wine into that. Right, right, right. Check this out. This is profound to me. He says to the servants, I want you to fill those six things, which are basically, I think, about 20 to 30 gallons a piece. That's what the screen says, I believe. He says to the servants, now, 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 here's the thing. You might have question, like, Jesus tells you to do something. Your pastor tells you to do something. Well, I can't see why that would benefit me to do it. Now, put yourself in these servant's shoes. They're out of wine, and, and Jesus says they don't really possibly even know who he really is. And he says, hey, hey, go down to the river or go down to the well, and I want you to fill these six huge religious bowls with water. Like, Why? Do you know how far that walk is? I mean, they, they can't go to the kitchen sink like we can. Right, right. They got to walk down and do what they do. And, and this equates now to 180 gallons of water that Jesus told them to go and fill to the brim. Sometimes when you're serving God, he's going to tell you to go pick up some water. You're going to look, well, why am I working this water? Why, why are we having this party? Why are we doing this? Why are we feeding fire? All I see is water. I don't see no miracle. This water is heavy. 180 gallons. Would you haul 180 gallons of water with Jesus that is mundane, tiring? You don't see the result of it right away, but you're willing to carry water for Jesus because if you carry water for Jesus, eventually your water will turn into wine. The problem is this. You get tired of carrying water and then it breaks and then you're tired and you wonder where your wine is. Your wine is when you get done with the assignment of the water. you got to carry for 15 years. I've been carrying water and I don't know when it's turning to wine but there's a lot of wine from the water I've been carrying. 
I love what it says here because these servants, they didn't know what was up. You know, they're carrying this water and they're probably tired and everybody's probably still complaining at the wedding. There's no wine. There's no wine. Well, I don't know if this water's going to turn into wine or not. 180 gallons. This is what blows my mind. I thought to myself as I was studying here. See, the people is, people go to church for religion. Water's clear. Wine's red. Religion is clear. The blood of Jesus is red. So when clear turns into red, tradition turns into transformation. So you got to understand what God does here. But this, at the end of this passage, it absolutely blows my mind. Because it's so cool to me because when they finally got done with their assignment... And church, I ask you the question. I have 100 people out in that parking lot that are carrying water right now. Right. Setting up tables, snow cone machines, cookers, roasters, grills, sweating. And, and yeah. they're just carrying water. But this afternoon, at some point, uh. that water will turn into wine. And if you ain't willing to carry your mundane water, you ain't ever going to see your wine. Yeah. You ain't going to do it. But... This is what is, read the end of the scripture. It's so profound to me. And I've lived it, I've seen it, I'm experiencing it as I stand here. When the water turned into wine, not when they were carrying it, not when the bowls were halfway full, when they were full to the brim, you can imagine the diligence and the determination it took for those servants to carry it. And, and, and what blows my mind is this. When it did, the people didn't know how it happened. But you know who did? the people that carried the water. The people that carried the water get more blessed than the people that drink the wine. So don't worry about what we're doing this afternoon. Just be a water carrier because when the water turns into wine, you're blessed. Now here's another party that Jesus goes to. Jesus goes to another party in Bethsaida. Now, this is a very famous party. And and Jesus does what he does. He comes rolling up, and he's having a party. Now he's got a huge following, and and we're seeing the growth and increase every year at this church and everything we're touching. And he's got a huge following, and and everybody's doing what they do. So his disciples are catering to all the people. I watch how my leaders cater to people. I watch their tolerance level. I watch their love level. Well, here's Jesus, and his disciples are tired. See, I don't like tired. Don't be tired around me. Don't be tired around Jesus either. And his disciples got tired. And his disciples said they they only had a a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread. And and the disciples were kind of done with the people. They were probably irritated with the people. Like you may become this afternoon. They were irritated with the people. They're watching all the people eat this free food and they run out of food and they're tired. And they say to Jesus, make the people go back to the town and buy their own food. Well, I'm not going to say that this afternoon. I'm going to buy their food. I'm going to serve their food and I ain't going to be tired. But the disciples were tired. And Jesus challenged their tired. Because what Bishop teaches me, if tired isn't challenged, it will always rain. And I can tell you, I see people sleep 12 hours a day and they're still tired. And at the end of the day, I'm never going to be spiritually tired. And Jesus is never spiritually tired. The disciples, they, they say, hold up, let's shut down the party. This afternoon, it might get a little hectic and you might want to shut down the party. And I'm here to tell you, when you want to shut down the party, I'm ready to open up the party. Because when you shut it down, we're going to open it up. And at the end of the day, the disciples are tired. So Jesus said, okay, bring me this little bit of fish and this little bit of loaves. See, see, when we started 15 years ago, we just had a little bit. We started this church six and a half years ago. We just had a little bit. We might have been able to serve some hot dogs, but we served them well. I mean, we, we, we might have had some knockoff ketchup that we had to buy at some knockoff store, but not no more. Because when we didn't have nothing, we treated nothing as something. If you treat your nothing as something, you'll get more of anything. Write that down. At the end of the day, it's blows my mind. So now here's what Jesus does. Hold up. No, no. They ain't going home. This party ain't over. That's good. Jesus puts the limited amount that he's got in his hands, holds it up to heaven, 
and thanks the Father. If you thank God for what you have, God will give you more. If you complain about what you do have, God will never give you more to complain about. You have to understand this biblical truth. And he holds it up, and all of a sudden, they got enough food to feed 5,000. I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. All I know is God told me to do it. And I do, just like Mary said, do whatever he says. And I do whatever he says, and then when it was all said and done, they fed 5,000 men. Let's give God a hand. So where are you at with our party? Where are you at with our party? Psalm 107. Today we will plant seeds of God's love. They sowed fields. This afternoon, we are sowing a lot into this community. We are probably sowing, Mayor, more into this community than ever has been sowed into this community. And they yielded a fruitful harvest. Harvest usually is in fall time. We're going to see a harvest today, but we're not, we don't know when the real harvest will come in. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, do not become weary in doing good, for at a proper time you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. I haven't given up for 15 years, and my life is full of harvest. But I really can't even enjoy the harvest because I'm too busy sowing. It goes on to say that he blessed them. God is going to bless us. Their numbers greatly increased. Our numbers have greatly increased because this is the things that we do. We're an out-of-the-box church. We do things that other churches don't do. That's why we got people coming to church that typically wouldn't come to church, that are afraid of church. God blessed them, it says, and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds diminish. The reason why Christianity is on the decline is because churches aren't doing what we're doing today. They're keeping all the money in. The money that comes in is supposed to go out. Yes, we got to pay the lighting bill and the air conditioning bill because you complained to me if it was too hot in here. So we got to keep the, the very place where you're sent to come in to be sent out. But herds are diminishing in churches all over the world, not this church, because this church is doing what Jesus says to do. It says in Ecclesiastes 11, 4, we are believing God for the necessary provisions. I love what it says. If you wait for perfect conditions, I'll say that again. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never. Our finances are low. Our giving is down, but I'm still throwing the party on faith. So if you can help me even more than you already did in offering, I would be greatly appreciated because I'm throwing a lot in the kitty. Our financial picture is not perfect. We sh- We possibly shouldn't do it, but we're gonna. See, you can't wait for everything to line up to do what God has told you to do. No, let me be very clear with you. I don't act financially irresponsible. I've been doing this for 15 years. I started with a hefty garbage bag and garage sale furniture in our first home. I know God's gonna deliver. It says in Matthew 9, we need to support the vision in all ways. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. This afternoon, we got to have compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless. There are, there's a hurting generation and world out there that is miserable. They work every day and they hate their jobs. They don't know how to get out of the situation they're in. They're harassed by the devil. They're harassed by their flesh. They're harassed. There's a hurting generation that really knows who the real Jesus is. Not religion. The real Jesus like sheep without a shepherd. A lot of people don't walk around with mentors. They just make decisions on their own. We got, a, we got a world without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We need more workers. We got more than enough already of people that I've ever seen, but we could use more. It says the workers are few. I mean, the volunteers in this church are abundant. I I did um, a funeral and home going for someone, and and, and they're on an on-fire church on the East Coast. They can't even get 20 people to volunteer in the church to do anything. You should see our volunteers. We got workers. That's why we're seeing. So it says send out the workers into the harvest field. This afternoon, I'm going to send you out. I'm sending you out right now to spread the love of Jesus. 
Don't be, don't be hitting people over the head with the Bible. Just smile at them. Just tell them you love them and you're grateful they came. Just love them and hug them. Be cont- love is contagious. Let them catch your love. Sneeze a little love on them. Cough a little love. On- don't do that literally, but... When I saw those community members coming in, they didn't know how to handle our love yesterday. But do it, do it in reason. Jesus shows compassion because people are hurting. They won't even admit they're hurting because they didn't learn that from their parents. They're so toughen up, toughen up. Just do it, just do it. I ain't, I'm not living a miserable life. I'm blessed beyond the curse. I got provisions that I never dreamed of. But what's a provision without joy? What's a provision without peace? So if we're going to do it, we're going to do it with excellence. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, today we will meet all people where they're at. The Bible says, though I am free to belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Say win. Win. Today we're going to win as many people as we can by simplicity and love. And we lead with generosity. When you lead with generosity, it will turn somebody around. People don't care how much you got or what you say. They care about how much you care and how much you love. And I love what it says here. So here, here's Paul, and he's saying all this. Just, I'll, I'll become anything to anyone just to win them for Jesus. To the weak, I became win to, weak to win the weak. I became all things to all people to, by all possible means to save some. You're not going to save everybody. But this afternoon, we're going to save some. And they not, may not get saved this afternoon. I don't care what church anybody goes to. I just want this event to get people to talk about church again. If they never step in this door, it doesn't matter to me. But I need to get them to Jesus. Because at the end of the day, they have children. And their children will eventually have children. And if those children don't get to know Jesus, those children, when they're, they're not going to have a good life. They may have good professions and make money, but they won't have the joy that they possibly could have. Not possibly, with Jesus. See, at the end of the day, I just started out 15 years ago because I got saved. And a saved person should be saving people. If you've experienced a miracle, you can be part of another person's miracle. I got invited to a leadership summit and they asked me what my life statement was. It says to leave this planet better than I found it. You can say something, for what? For why do we do what we do? In the Bible, read your screen, it says for the sake of the gospel. Second Corinthians 9 says, SVCC, our church gives away what God gives us. Anything you got ain't yours. I know you work for it. I work, I got like six deals going on. Eight deals, companies, entities, all this stuff. God gave me the talent to work the deal. So whatever the provisions and profits are of the deal, they're his anyway, because without him, I would never have the talent to do it. I mean, especially a drug addict like me. I mean, I shouldn't have this life. So everything that comes in, the majority of it needs to go out. And this is what God says, if you live like this, this is how your lives will look like. Now, he who supplies seeds to the sower, we're sowers, we're big, generous people. Seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply an increase of the store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. For 15 years, God's expanded our territories. Why? Because we're generous. We're not just kind of generous. And I say this with all humility. We're really generous. Because the Bible, I read, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. If you ain't refreshed this morning, that's because you ain't generous. You ain't generous. You're not giving what God has given you. And here's the thing about my God. You can never outgive God. You can never outgive God. And as we close this morning, after Jesus fed the 5,000, him and the disciples left on a boat 
But Jesus said, I'm going to stay back. You go ahead of me. So the disciples, after the water turned into wine and all, I'll probably start doing what he says because he's never let me down. I'm not going to ask him 20 times. I'm just going to ask him once. Just I learned that from his mother. Hey, just do what he says. And she left him. Go back to your business as you ask to the Lord what you want from him. I don't even ask him. I just say, may your will be done. Whatever you will to be done, I'm with it. I learned that from him. The devil's been trying to kill him for years. He got a transplant. Last year he was down. We didn't, you know, everybody didn't know if they may. I knew he would make it. He called me crying and asked for prayers. A man like this calls me for prayer, and today he travels here to party with me. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for you. The devil is a liar. The devil can never stop you. He's got an assignment. I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. I rebuke any assignment over your life. I love you, man. See, Holloway, God wanted me to tell you this. You travel with Bishop Jakes around the world. You've seen a lot of miracles. Sometimes Bishop would say to you, hey, hey, you go ahead of me. (laughs) I'm going to stay here. You go make sure it's good where I'm going next. No different than Jesus, he said to the disciples, get on the boat, because after a miracle comes a storm. Church, prepare yourself from a storm after we do what we do today. The storm is going to come. The storm is coming, and Jesus is on floor. The waves get real high. The disciples are freaking out. And before they know it, here, here, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's happening, Holloway. The latter part of your life is going to be greater than the former, and your former is great. You're, you're, you're going to see this, Holloway. It looks like a storm. And Jesus is going to come walking on water. He's going to say, come on, Holloway. I need you out of this sickness. I need you out of this pain. And you're going to walk on water. But you ain't going to do what Peter did. You ain't going back to your boat. You're going to teach other people how to walk on water. Let's give God a hand. All you have is friends, and that's about as good as it gets for me. I love you with all my heart. So after the storm comes, church, after we do what we're going to do, it's going to get real ugly. Look for the Lord walking on water. And let me tell you this, give me something behind me. When it gets real gray and life don't look that good after we do what we're going to do, You got to get a little faith because Jesus is calling you out of this level into another level and you got to walk. You got to be willing to walk out of your comfort zone and you got to walk on water. And when life doesn't look too good, you got to keep walking. Don't pay attention to your circumstances. Just keep your eye on Jesus. When I get done with today, I'm getting out of the boat. I'm going to another level. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. We're about ready to do things we've never done before. It's real dark back here, but I'm going to keep on walking. I'm going to keep on doing. I'm going to keep on believing. Church, I need you at the altar now. I need you at the altar now. I need you at the altar now.